It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Back when I was doing my undergraduate psychology degree, we're going back a couple of decades now, during the developmental psychology course that I took, I was introduced to the work of Jay Belsky. Jay Belsky is, has been, and continues to be one of the world's foremost experts on childcare. What we do with our kids when they're too little for school, but we need them to go somewhere to be looked after because, well, life is complicated. What I found when I was doing that research surprised me. It seemed that the ideological positions that people took on childcare were not consistent with what research showed. But whenever I would point that out, I kind of got shouted down. Now, I recognize that this is a really sensitive topic and I want to tread carefully here. But I recently came across an article written by Jay Belsky and Janet Erickson. I've reached out to Janet Erickson to give me a bit of an overview and help us to understand what research is actually telling us about kids and childcare so that we can well, when our kids need to be there, when we need that double income, when the economy demands two parents working, what we can do to help our children to thrive when childcare does not always support them best. Now, before we start, I want to highlight, I recognize that for many people, it's simply essential. Secondly, I want to recognize that people who work in childcare in the main are exceptional and loving and committed people who really want the best for our kids. But the research doesn't always point in the most helpful direction. So that's what this conversation is about, just so that we can know what's happening. Janet Erickson is a fellow at the Institute for Family Studies in the United States, also a fellow of the Wheatley Institution and an associate professor in the School of Family Life at Brigham Young University. Erickson's research specializing in maternal and child well-being in the context of work and family life has been featured in all of the big major news outlets. And as a social science research fellow at the Heritage Foundation, she completed an extensive review of research on the effects of non-parental care on children's development, especially for policymakers. Janet, I really appreciate you giving some time, staying up late in the United States to talk with me about this conversation. Thanks for joining me. So good to be with you. Thank you, Justin. Janet, you've got a couple of kids yourself, personal question, but can I ask, did you put them into care or did you have the, the privilege and luxury of having them at home with you for a few years? Yes, I did have the privilege and luxury of being at home with them. I sometimes laugh that they got too much of me, <laughs> but it was it was important to me to be able to do that and I was able to do that. My husband, he was put in daycare when he was six weeks old for 40 hours a week and I'll talk a little bit about his experience and the findings that kind of track his experience. I thought you were going to tell me that you could explain it all because of the 40 hours a week. I should <laughs> yeah, say that. No. Probably not very polite of me to say that. So, so what does the research point to when it comes to daycare? My recollection from all those years ago was that too little and too much are definitely not healthy for kids, but there was, I guess, a, an optimum number of hours where the kids seemed to settle in feel good about the routine and do reasonably well. Yes. How's the research changed since, well, the last time I looked at it 20 years ago? Yes. I think you said roughly what, so the United States did this massive study starting in the late 80s, 1990s, and it tracked children and it's still tracking those children across all of development. And it was fascinating because as you recognize, this is very sensitive, politically sensitive, difficult because it's it, getting to the core of what we care most about, like as parents and doing whatever we can to help our children. And so as they started out, they were tracking data at six months and 18 months and 24 months. And they found a little bit of concern at 24 months connected to what we call early extensive daycare, which would mean put in daycare before nine months old for an extensive number of hours, which would be 35 to 40 hours per week. And they saw just a little bit of maybe concern in terms of social emotional relationships those children had. By 36 months, three years, it looked like it disappeared and everyone was like, oh good, that was just a little blip. This isn't such a big deal. And then at four and a half, that challenge emerged strongly. And what it showed is that children who had entered extensive early hours of daycare, that same idea, within the first year of life for 35 to 40 hours per week, were at significantly increased risk of social emotional challenges. And that would be externalizing behaviors, internalizing behaviors, conflict with caregivers, conflict with parents. And so all of a sudden, it was Jay Belsky who was on that massive project who just said, we have to think about this. We, we can't just ignore this. And then 
as they tracked the children across development, it continued that kind of increased risk was seen in kindergarten and then third grade and sixth grade. And it showed up in a little bit different way, ninth grade, 12th grade, where there was increased risk for risky behaviors um, and, and showing up in that internalizing, externalizing way. So I think what it alerted us to is that this isn't just something to be cavalier about as a culture or as individuals. And when we look at early development, and and this has become more clear as technology has allowed us to look at brain development, that you can see in the very earliest period of infancy, that whole right brain, which is the social emotional side, it's the affect side, it's regulation of emotions, identity, it's really massively expanding. One million synapses a second. And so across that first year and a half, this side of the brain that really impacts our foundation, social emotionally, is is a very sensitive period of development. And it's going to happen healthy when in connection with another caring human being. So that attachment relationship becomes really important in that early period. And it's a sensitive, responsive caregiver, parent, really that's shaping that development. And that's typically mother because a child and a mother are hardwired for that experience. And I think just appreciating it tells us a child needs strong relationship from which to develop. And I think that provides the answer to the daycare research in the sense that it's saying, when there's a lot of hours that that child is in an environment away from that caregiving, then they could be at increased risk because of the developmental processes that are going on in the brain. And at the same time, it tells us if those relationships are strong, like mother, father, child relationships are strong, then children are going to be okay. So the data showed it didn't matter how much time a child was in daycare in terms of impacting the attachment relationship. You could have a secure relationship with that parent. It's a very important relationship, no matter how many hours in daycare it appeared. But apart from that, lots of hours could increase the risk for some children of experiencing social emotional challenges and to be aware of it. So I think for us, you know, Canada experimented with this in Quebec and there was a lot of news about it. I remember the Canada study. I was going to actually ask you about it. So I'm glad you brought it up. It was painful because the idea was let's expand women's access essentially, right, to employment and increase productivity that way. And so provide a government funded daycare at a cheap rate. It was like $15 a month or something. And so everybody kind of got massively propelled into daycare and and it wasn't it was really hard to maintain the quality that you would want in that massive expansion and so quality was compromised but even when we consider quality factors that early extensive lots of hours was was a predictor of challenges not for every child but a chunk of those children even into crime rates as they were young adults so for us in the US, right, that was a that was a caution that a massive expansion of daycare may cause a huge number of children, some of whom will be at greater risk for a, a large number of hours, and that that could compromise social emotional health. Several questions on this. I'll try to stick with one thing at a time. First off, you've used the word predictor. You've talked about the relationship between these extended hours from a very early age in childcare and the potential negative outcomes uh, in later childhood and adolescence, whether it's social and emotional things or whether it's risky and sensation-seeking behavior. Yeah. The idea of something being a predictor, for those who are not familiar with the, the psychological sciences, when we talk about a predictor or an association, you're not saying that somebody who goes to daycare for extended hours from a young age is going to become a criminal. That's not what you're saying. What you're suggesting is that the risk of less optimal outcomes increases the more that that thing happens. So what other, you also use the word risk factors. What other risk factors exist that I, I guess increase the potential that things might not go well? And, and I guess as an extension of that question, what are the things that 
are protective. If parents are literally saying, my hands are tired, I don't have a choice. I, I mean, we've got an Australian government that is very much about growth and getting everybody into the workforce because that yeah. drives the economy. And and yeah. I mean, to buy a house is just so expensive or even to rent. And so a lot of people feel trapped. They feel like they have to. So I'm sure a lot of people listen to this and saying, I want my child to be socially and emotionally strong. I want to reduce the risk of any risk-taking behavior and sensation-seeking yeah. dangerous behaviors. What are the risk factors and the protective factors in those early years? Yeah, so, so helpful. So a, a few on the child side. And I think interesting that for the Americans, the United States data, what it showed is that daycare centers themselves were particularly at greater risk. So having a child in a family kind of care situation, right, the neighborhood care center seemed to be less consistently a predictor of increased risk than the daycare center. So it, it suggests that you can like provide a center or you know a daycare situation that is more like a family situation than So would that be that's a quality of care issue and a stability of caregiver issue. Yes. I, I presume they're the two central variables there. Yes, that's exactly right. So a ratio that's that's right more adult to child than you might find in a great big center, right, could be helpful. Now, having said that, there's no question certain children are more susceptible than others. And I think parents are remarkable at being attuned to, you know, for this child, it's really hard for them to be away. For this one, they don't seem to have the same experience. And so it's clear that children themselves are different. And then I think the other key factor is looking at that early period, especially. So it's that early entrance in that first year of life when the brain is really at a more sensitive place uh, in terms of that kind of development that I think being mindful of that time. So when we ask parents in the United States, like, what's your ideal work family kind of situation? What do you do? Are you interested in full-time daycare outside the home? Are you interested in part-time? Like, you know, what does it look like? And really parents are, what they want to do with young, young children is they want to handle the care themselves to the best that they can and and then have something more akin to family dynamic, to a family dynamic when they need outside of home care. Like there's just low interest in center care for children for long hours. Americans just like Australians on that. We've got Australian data that points in the same direction. Overwhelmingly, Australian parents say, yeah, I absolutely want to be with my kids for as long as I can, as long as I can deal with the economic realities that I'm facing. Yes. So my thought is, and I think this is borne out in research, is as we increase flexibility around work, place, time, and really emphasize that, then we facilitate more of that dynamic. Because what happened during COVID for us is when, you know, parents in a certain work spectrum came home, they were able to experience this dynamic of kind of shared caregiving and flexibility around all of that. And they liked it. It was healthier, healthier for men and healthier for women. So you're, you're trying to help provide a situation that's high quality for families who are at work, right, to put children in a, in a care situation for as few hours as you can, right, but recognizing it's the stuff we do at home that matters. So I think you're recognizing that, but you're also trying on the other side to push for greater flexibility that will allow parents to do what they really want to do. And that's, that's to manage that care themselves. And that's kind of an all hands on deck effort, right, on both sides of the policy world. Janet, I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm thinking this is the, the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. As you've described the challenges that are associated with having children in care for extended periods from a long, uh, fr- from a young age, you've just highlighted what we do at home matters so much. You've talked about the yeah. importance of that attachment relationship. Great yeah. thing about Australia, uh, and I know the US doesn't have this, but in Australia, we've got a paid parental leave scheme. Uh, my understanding is that it's based on the weekly national minimum wage rate, which is somewhere around about eight or 900 bucks a week. And the employee can get paid for up to 18 weeks and the money is either um, given directly to the employee or it goes by the employer to the employee, which is wonderfully helpful for parents for the first 18 weeks. But as you said, less than six months, in fact, less than nine months is what we're trying to hang on to. We want the kids with us yeah. then. If I am a time poor parent who just yeah. wants answers now, and if I've got a young child, a young baby who I'm feeling well, I'm feeling torn. I can't afford to live because of inflation and cost of living pressures unless I go back to work. Yeah. What are the things that I can do to help my child to thrive in spite of the fact that they're going to go to some sort of care facility? 
I think you're looking for, and every parent's doing this, they're trying to find a care situation that is as good as it can be. And we know that infancy across when, when an infant is put in daycare, they experience an increase of cortisol over the day. So that's a stress hormone, right? That's, that's the hormone that makes you go, oh, I'm a little bit wired right now. I'm a little bit stressed out. Yes, that's right. And so I think we see that like, there's a biological reality that, and just being appreciative of the fact that that can be a stressor for a child to be away from this person, right? That is, they're, they're barely able to understand that they are a separate person from this person that they've attached to. So I think appreciating that and trying to find the right kind of care situation. But the other thing that's interesting that you're highlighting is in the Quebec data, they found that some of the effect, the negative effect was carried by by healthy families who then stopped doing the practices they had done before in terms of reading to children at night, time with children at night. And I, I don't know if it was that they thought, well, that's being taken care of in the daycare center, so we don't need to do that kind of thing. But it itself had implications for the child. So it's, it, I think, highlighting that even if that child is away from you during hours, maintaining those connecting practices of holding, of reading to, of playing with, of eating together, of having consistent rituals of connection, they're very, very powerful. And they can be hard to maintain, right? Because it's like, ah, there we got so much to do. But it's almost like just the consistency of bedtime routines, of connection rituals that even might not take a lot of time, but they're reliable and consistent. They carry unbelievable weight in my experience. I love that phrase, rituals of connection. Rituals of connection. I've never used it, but it's beautiful. And they are powerful and they don't have to take a lot of time. They don't have to take a lot of money. And children hunger. They hunger for an experience of connection with parents. And so I think protecting those when we can't protect all the time that we might want is is to just highlight the value of that time. Janet Erickson is a fellow at the Institute for Family Studies, a fellow of the Wheatley Institution and Associate Professor in the School of Family Life at Brigham Young University. She's done a whole lot of research on non-parental care, on children's development for policymakers. And Janet, uh, just so grateful for what you've shared with us in this conversation. I think that uh, what you've offered is reassurance and a way through when we're sometimes dealing with the the things in life that we wouldn't necessarily choose for ourselves, but they're foisted upon us because the world is what it is. So thank you so much for your conversation with us today. So good to be with you. Thank you, Justin. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rulon from Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. For more information about how to make your family happier and especially to deal with your little people and their big feelings, check out our resources online at happyfamilies.com.au. And while you're there, jump on the wait list for The Quest. The Quest is our brand new membership program designed to literally hold your hand step by step as we take your family from, well, hopefully reasonably functional to absolutely flourishing. All the details are at happyfamilies.com.au. Hold up. 